everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this, the fourth 2003 ILAE e forum. Um, I appreciate we're now into 2024, a little into 2024, but this was the fourth of the series for 2023, talking about um, transition of our paediatric patients into adulthood. Um, just to highlight the um, ground rules for this is that we are going to have a series of three talks by um, speakers I'll introduce shortly. Um, we won't, at the end, we will have some questions and answers, so you'll need to put the questions into the box at the bottom. We're not able to respond to questions referring to a spe specific case or patient. I need to, once the slides start moving, introduce this webinar. <clears throat> At least that I've got uh, two colleagues. I'm Helen Cross, president of the International League Against Epilepsy, and I happen to be in my day job, paediatric neurologist from London in the UK. And I'm joined um, on this occasion by our two co-chairs of the Transition Task Force of the International League Against Epilepsy, Rima Nabu from France and Daniela Andrade from uh, uh, Canada. For this and the whole series of um, uh, eFora, I wish to acknowledge the support that we've had from Jazz Fast Pharmaceuticals and UCB. As I've already highlighted, um, we, what we will do is we will go through the series of three talks with a little bit of clarification and discussion in between. And at the end, we will have a further 30 minutes available for your questions which we will try and answer. If you could type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, subsequently, at the end of the forum, we will ask you to complete a short survey um, in order to know what we need to do better for the future. So as I said, there are three of us speaking today, and this just highlights our conflicts of interest. So I'm going to start the ball rolling, so to speak, to talk a little bit about an introduction to transition and specifically about the challenge of transition. So when we talk about transition in um, for people with epilepsy, what are we really talking about? Well, we can look at definitions and transition, we really wish to feel, is not transfer. It is not abrupt transfer. Transition is actually the process necessary to prepare youth for moving into adult care. Whereas transfer, which may be part of that, but not the whole story, is the formal handing over of care from paediatric to adult healthcare providers. But as we know, as paediatric neurologists, within paediatrics, services are relatively well defined for children and adolescents with um, epilepsy, with most care provided by paediatricians and paediatric neurologists. Whereas in adult services, the situation is not necessarily so clear cut. And depending on geographical region and circumstance, adult care for those with epilepsy may be in primary care, maybe in adult neurology, psychiatry, learning disability psychiatry, general medicine, and even within adult neurology, the individuals um, taking over that care may not have a specialist knowledge of epilepsy. And there is also an ongoing discussion about the timing of transition. And that may well depend on the situation of the individual, the family, the local provision, and indeed, of course, the environmental circumstance, for example, children and their school attendance and when that may cease. So first of all, I'd like to have a poll um, to see what proportion of you we have of relevant specialties. So the poll will be put up and I want you to indicate whether you are a paediatrician, paediatric neurologist, primary care physician, general physician, neurologist, psychiatrist, or indeed other. So I think this highlights that we have a range of individuals, paediatrics, paediatric neurologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, we have one, and other. So it'd be interesting to see ultimately, I suppose, what those other may be. So what are the key considerations when we consider transition? Well, first of all, who are we doing this for? 
Are we doing it for the child themselves, the family, the healthcare workers, or all three? And when, as I've said, when are we considering on embarking on this? And this may depend on age, um, whether that's relevant to the duration in education, the care setting, whether residential or non-residential, the level of autonomy of the individual um, child, adolescent that we have in front of us, and indeed the level of independence. And of course, then we have to bear in mind that actually one size does not fit all. We're going to have to look at what service we have, but then fit, fit it with regard to bespoke um, care with regard to the individual circumstance. So now I'd like to ask the question for another poll, really, um, about which epilepsies you think need a transition plan. The idiopathic generalised epilepsies, the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, focal onset epilepsies, self-limited focal epilepsies, or perhaps all epilepsies with a continued diagnosis in adolescence. And I think that's absolutely right. We need to think, you know, all epilepsies with continued diagnosis, so all those with active epilepsy in adolescence, and as we may come to in discussion, there may be others that we have to prepare for adult care um, in, the, in, in the circumstance that something else may occur. So again, when we're considering transition, there remains another challenge, namely the different types of epilepsy and indeed different types of individual we may have be having to transition the care of. There are those that are cognitively able, that are going to gain independence and have an autonomy over their ongoing care. And of course, there are those with have maybe mild or even moderate or severe learning difficulty, cognitive impairment, who will need a degree of guidance and of course, oversight. There are specific groups of individuals, which means, again, that it's not going to be a one size fits all um, process. There's those with new onset of epilepsy in adolescence, those that may be just coming to terms with the diagnosis, what that means and what they need to continue into adulthood. The epilepsies that <clears throat> have been a continued diagnosis in childhood, but their needs may change with age or indeed their epilepsies may, themselves may change with age. What about underlying diagnoses? Do we have to rethink in some individuals, such as the metabolic and mitochondrial disorders? There'll be epilepsies with differing presentation, perhaps that we need to think about in adulthood as opposed to in childhood. And those that I've listed as static disorders where they have ongoing active epilepsy, their condition is unlikely to change, but there may need to be specific considerations moving forward. And there may also need to be treatment specific transition that we need to consider. Not least, have surgical evaluation been undertaken? Does that need to be considered? Have they had surgery? Do they need ongoing follow up? Vagal nerve stimulation needs ongoing review and check. And the ketogenic diet, a constant challenge. If they're on it in the teenage years, where do they go for management and mod um, monitoring in adulthood? So what about the new onset epilepsies in adolescence? Well, I've taken this from um, the paper on nosology of the epilepsy syndromes of, um, that come on in later childhood and of variable age. And we have a range of different epilepsies that we need to consider. Certainly the idiopathic generalized epilepsies that are actually here in green. There are those which may have a differing presentation and may be difficult, um, particularly as they may change and progress with age, such as Rasmussen's and progressive myoclonic epilepsies, more in association with the deterioration. And then we've got the focal onset epilepsies, some of which um, may come on in late adolescence, such as sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy with ongoing um, uh, epilepsy into adulthood, and the self-limiting epilepsy, limited epilepsies, some of which may extend into late teenage years. And then there's the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, some of which may change with age. And this is where we have, yes, we have four distinct types of epilepsy with similar presentation, EEG abnormality and seizure types. But of course, there may be some a degree of overlap, not least some of those that we may diagnose as childhood absence epilepsy, actually being apparent as juvenile absence, of which has got different implications, implications for diagnosis into adulthood, as well as those that evolve into juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and the implications for that that we have that needs ongoing adult care. 
We have to bear in mind that in those some of those who present in early childhood, they may actually have a metabolic or mitochondrial cause. And maybe we have to have a high index of suspicion in deciding on those that need further evaluation. Some metabolic disorders, it's not unusual for there to be a latent period um, in pre between presentation and perhaps even deterioration later on. And some even, of course, particularly mitochondrial, may present in adolescent or adulthood. There are etiological syndromes with changing problems into adulthood that may need more of a multidisciplinary approach, such as tuberous sclerosis. It's a multi-system disease. Epilepsy may be key, but it's not the only issue that needs to be monitored. There's the whole issue about renal involvement, lung involvement, mental health, intellectual disability, and even genetic counselling that will need ongoing review in adulthood. And of course, Dravet syndrome. Most of those who present are dependent, they can't live independently, and there are ongoing changes in what the concerns might be as time goes on. Epilepsy is part of that, maybe a prominent part of that, but of course there's gait issues, there are sleep concerns, eating disorders, and then the long-term issues of osteopenia. And the whole issue that we now know that many of them can live well into adulthood, you know, increased survival previously thought not to be there because of the re the um, uh, risk of sudden death. But we know there are many undiagnosed adults and there's an evidence of some degree of progressive neurological deterioration. This all needs to be considered and these individuals need to be under the care of specialist neurologists. And of course, other electroclinical syndromes, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, continue to cause, pro cause problems into adulthood. Seizures continue into adulthood, a high rate of dependence with a severe learning disability and challenging behaviour. And these are, can all need oversight with regard to their epilepsy care. Yes, there are epilepsies with differing presentations in adulthood, and maybe that may manifest in late um, teenage years such as autoimmune disorders, there's a higher likelihood of presentation, presentation and maybe even a higher likelihood of neoplastic um, presentation in association with that. But also the way Frasmussen's presents can be a little different, a slower presentation with the older presentation and surgical decisions perhaps more difficult, particularly of dominant hemisphere as they approach adulthood. Maybe decisions need to be made before they get there. And then ultimately, this is what I call the static disorders, particularly the structural epilepsies. Have they had assessment for epilepsy surgery? Have they had epilepsy surgery? Has that been successful? Has that um, resulted in suboptimal outcome, namely seizures continue? What is their long term follow up? And even when they've had surgery that's been successful, some degree of preparation will be needed as to who they may need to contact should indeed problems arise. So in a rather whistle-stop tour, I hope I've highlighted that transition is a challenge. It's not a one-size-fits-all. There are many different types of epilepsy, age of individual, degree of autonomy that need to be taken into consideration. But transition is a process. We need to be secure both for the family and the individual for regard to transition and transfer of care. And there's no doubt that all with active epilepsy really require a transition plan. The timing of how that and how that may be done will be dependent on individual circumstances. Different epilepsies indeed have different needs. So transition, even though there may be a service, does need to be individualised and there will be consequent variable demands on a service, which we are going to discuss within subsequent talks. So on that note, I ask my colleagues to come back online just to ask whether they have any specific questions they want to um, raise from that or comment even that something I might not have um, raised. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you very much for this very comprehensive talk where you insisted on some uh, points that are the no size fits all. And it makes me think about can you tell us a bit more when the epilepsy is not very complex, when the patient uh, does not have two or three medication with a very active epilepsy, what would be the important things that we should uh, take care of during this transition process? 
I think that there's there's no doubt, and I think when prominent we're looking, particularly thinking perhaps about the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, where there may be seizure control, but they have to, you know, there is a need to understand their underlying diagnosis, their need for their regular medication, empowerment to the degree of taking control of their lifestyle, perhaps what the, you know, optimizing it, and even discussing the risks of the seizures and indeed SUDAP. And I think these are all things that with cognitively able individuals with epilepsies that may be well controlled, we do need to ensure in that transition that they begin to understand that they do understand, take control of giving their own medication and recognize the need to be aware of their diagnosis and the need for their medication moving particularly into their early 20s. It is a difficult time for parents and individuals. A time of adolescence is never easy, even when you haven't got a diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, but really, I think we need to take all that into consideration and moving towards empowerment to the individuals. Thank you very much. OK. So on that note, I go on. we go on to our next speaker, Professor Rima Nabu, who's Professor and of Paediatric Neurology and Head of Rare Diseases at Imagine and at Necker Children's Hospital in Paris. And as also as co-chair for many years, of the Transition Task Force of the International League Against Epilepsy, she has long thought and put forward um, the idea about the need for, for transition and possible models. So great to have you here, Rima, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Helen. And I really appreciate being able to discuss about this subject that indeed I'm working on since some years, and because our patients are, are aging and are getting older and we are facing this problem in our everyday clinic. And uh, the thought was how to organize it. And this is what I will present, how we build a program for complex epilepsies in our institution. What is important to know that uh, I'm in a pediatric hospital, so there was an additional need uh, to this transfer and to preparing with the transition, this transfer to an adult setting. And uh, this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, just reminding that today, complex epilepsies and DEEs, Helen, you talked about surgical epilepsies, you talked about other syndromes, uh, they do not disappear in the null when they become adults. And we know that over 50% of these DEEs, for instance, people with monogenic epilepsies, will, and uh, we are happy that they are still there and they will need this transition. So this was a very important point, I would say, to, to begin uh, with. And uh, the other point, um, the, the other point is that we focus much on the seizures. And I loved, Helen, your answer about the patients who had who have a, a control in a way of their seizures. But remember that in DEEs, we are in a population where epilepsy remains active, where seizures remaining there might change in type, in duration, in their timing, in their trigger factors, and so on. The example of Dravé is important because it's easy to understand. Uh, patients, when they are becoming older, will have more nocturne during sleep seizures and not awake seizures. The seizure therapies in these DEEs are important to know because we have more and more new orphan drugs developing or drugs used in pediatric age much more than in adult age. So there should be an understanding of these therapies and the possibility to initiate these therapies in an older age when the patient did not receive yet uh, these uh, treatments. And, and what is important is that I emphasized one slide on the seizures 
Helen also uh, presented that, but I really would love to emphasize again and again that the life of a patient and the follow-up of the patient and the needs of a patient go beyond the seizures, much beyond. Within this population on DEE, many problems that I tried to summarize uh, in this figure from feeding to uh, behavior, to psychiatric disorders, to gait, to movement disorders, and definitely sleep and SUDAP that can persist in the, in the adult age. So this multidisciplinarity is a key point when we are thinking about this transition and answering these needs is very important. I like to say, because we are pediatric, I am pediatric neurologist, that we always had this impression that children were treated as little adults. And today we know this concept is accepted that children are not little adults. But what I would say, let us do not go and do uh, wrongly on the other way. And adults are not kids who grown up, although I love uh, the cartoons. Adults are really different from children as children are different from adults. For different points, I put some, mm, some of them here in this slide, but there is also and definitely more. I will not emphasize much the adolescence period in which our work on transition is major because this is a period, and I will repeat again that Away of the epilepsy, this is a period where there uh, children becoming adolescents and going into adulthood will need a special attention and a special follow up. So the no size fits all, Helen showed it nicely, but I want to emphasize on it because we cannot translate programs, translate needs from one patient to another, from one syndrome to another, the complexity of the needs and of the interventions are different within the DEEs. Think about the tuberous sclerosis uh, complex patients. Think about the lennox gasto patients. Think about the patients with deficit, with deficit in GLUT1. And you will see that in addition to a common to common needs, they have special needs. And I told you that I'm in a pediatric institution, so your local context of care is very important too. Some colleagues told me once I was talking about transition, but we are taking care about the patients from the beginning till the end. What is this transition? They are not moving. Even if they are not moving, again, the needs might change. And I will not emphasize more the gender issue in this period, uh, the contraception, the pregnancies, and so on. So the point also is where those children will transfer Will they stay in, in with the family or with another tutor? Will they move to general practitioner, to neurologist? Do they need a reference center for complex epilepsies? Will they go in centers with adults with disabilities, where in many instances there are psychiatrists, but there are less epileptologists? This will be important because this is how we will think about it. And I will go to the other part. So with all of these thoughts and with what, what was already suggested in the literature, we went into the building of our program. And my question will be, who in your opinion should be involved in the building of a transition program? Child neurologist, adult neurologist, patients and families, an active coordinator, all of the above. And I would love to see uh, your answers. So the poll is arriving. And I think that the point should be, again, thinking that we are in a situation where 
different point of views, different thoughts, different needs should be discussed and uh, should be in a way uh, uh, seen and consulted in order to uh, build uh, this uh, program. So I will, uh, and, and I'm happy to see that uh, all of you agrees, agree with me that all of these persons should be involved. And the place of an active coordinator was really very highly emphasized in different papers and in different thoughts uh, about this uh, program. So this is what we did indeed. We involved the state uh, uh, stakeholders that are there, the patient, the pediatric and the adult neurologist, and definitely our institution, and I'm sorry for the French, but our health authorities, because for a program, you need to, at some moment, to have, uh, be able to sustain it and to work on it. And I will not detail the work we did. What I wanted to say that for every uh, experience, for every questionnaire, we published that, we validated and peer reviewed the journals. And to go very quickly, for instance, this was the questionnaire for the adult and child neurologist. It was back in 2013 to say that a transition program cannot be built in two days. And the major actions that were noted from both sides were to improve the means of communication. And I will discuss about this later on. The nightmare of the medical history and file, although we have the electronic health reports, improve the education of adult neurologists on DEEs and or their specific needs and the problems improve the preparation of transition by us pediatric neurologists. The thing that was uh, really less appreciated was new faces and new places, and definitely the most important, secure the different needs of the patient. If the adult epileptologist cannot provide them, you should inform him about these needs in order to organize them. The voice of the families, we did it with two uh, syndromes, with two DEEs, uh, Dravet syndrome and uh, tuberous sclerosis complex. And there was much about the literature about the attachment of the families uh, to the pediatric uh, caregiver and to the pediatric team. It doesn't mean that there is no attachment, but when you provide for the families the same care, the attachment is definitely less impactful. When you think and you do not leave needs left behind, the problems are less impactful. The coordination and avoiding the lost in transition was very important. A specific need the family emphasized about the social workers. And again, they raised the fear of new faces and new places. This is why we should initiate to talk about this and present this. Here you can see uh, Helen and Danielle, but you can see also other groups of our colleagues, because since 2013, we initiated a work within a group that is today, uh, over, we, we, we take over this work by the task force on transition at the International League. And when we worked with two exceptional pediatric neurologists, Peter and Carol Camfield, and we did meetings in order to think about how we can shed the light, how we can advance and orchestrate this transition. And there is a coming meeting following uh, this year in September. I have to admit also that we had a very nice transversal discussion in our institution because we are in a pediatric institution of rare and genetic disorders in different disciplines. And we provided this 
uh, facility, La Suite, which is at the same time the follow-up. But when you go to a very, very nice hotels, La Suite is the very nice uh, big room where you can have really much facilities. And where we had these non-medical experts, mainly the social worker, the sports coach, educators, makeup specialists, and so on. And where we have some medical clinics that are not epileptology or neurology, as you can see, and where the patients can consult or the specialist can come to our clinic or after our clinic and see the patients. So this facility helped us much. The other point I told you that the communication and having tons of paper or tons of electronic health records was a very big problem for adults. So we work at the national uh, uh, level. And before getting into this, I wanted to know if you are using in your country, in your work, an electronic health record. Because what I want to emphasize is definitely an electronic health record is much better. But when you have patients with uh, 89 clinics, and 180 prescriptions with 25 long duration EEGs, even this can be complicated. So it is not about having much paper or having electronic health records. It is about the team that followed the patient. If he can summarize, and I'm happy to hear that because my second slide would be for both of you. If he is able to summarize the history of the patient and what was really important for the patient in a transition passport. This is the summary. Passport is a bit aggressive sometimes when we hear about passports and visa, but this is a very friendly tool where we worked on it with the French League Against Epilepsy, with the Pediatric Neurology Society in France, with a group working on this, and where we were able to summarize in less than three pages, whatever the file is, these important issues about the patient, the history, the development, the different needs, the major exams and their results, but also about the tutor, about the financial support. And I can tell you that this is really very, very helpful, but it will need some time to work on it. I will end with the last part of my talk and asking these questions. Which of these areas of expertise are most often missed in the transition to adult care of patients with DEEs? And time for you to make the poll. Gastroenterology, orthopedic surgery, psychiatry, gynecology, all of the above. In your opinion, which one is the most often missed in this a transition and especially when we transfer the patient. And I will look. So I fully agree with the, all of the above, but I also have to emphasize that the behavioral issue and the psychiatric problems, and two days ago I was with a young lady with PCDH19 clustering epilepsy, and she's not doing any more seizures, but she has a very clear uh, psychiatric problems. And sometimes, hopefully not in your country, psychiatrists are not not very, very interested in those patients. And it was also another struggle that we had to do. And I think we succeeded to a certain uh, level. I will end basically with this slide. This slide was inspired by other programs 
uh, that were ongoing, not only in epilepsy, but on other chronic pediatric diseases. The point is to say that we need to have time to prepare this with some additional time on your clinic, with some specific clinic. The point is to be able to discuss these different points. And you can see in red that we involve very early in this transition work, the social worker, the pediatric nurse, uh, the pediatric neurologist that is following the patient definitely should work on this, revising the diagnosis. We involve our gynecology colleagues, and I'm really happy that it is now systematic for all girls. And our last step that is between 16 and 18 years is a day hospital when the adult nurse is presented so the new faces are a bit uh, answered, although we do not have the new places, because all, of, because all of the program is done in our institution, where we have, we give this pack with the transition passport, with all the information, the last thing we want to give to the patient, and we validate that we did not forget anything. And I think Danielle will talk a bit more about what we can forget in patients we are following since 16 years where some genetic testing were not available. So this done, the adults will receive the patient within six months of this day hospital. And we will have, after all of this, a final clinic with them to be sure that all is doing well. So I will end uh, with this, find your program, whatever you're, you are working in, and help in organizing the program if you are adult or psychiatrist. No size fits all. Don't leave no one behind. I'm talking about DEEs, but it can be also with patient uh, without severe or without complex, I'm sorry, epilepsies coordination and multidisciplinarity. Use the tools that were developed, even if you want to adapt them. Empower and educate phys physicians. We introduced a transition course for the pediatric people and for the adult people working on epilepsy into our national course. And definitely think about the evaluation uh, to ensure the sustainability. This is our task force. Uh, all people that are there are uh, very keen and putting ideas and working on this. And we hope that we will be able in our meeting this year and in further uh, uh, communication and papers to give a bit more information and more help to help everyone to build this program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rima. Very comprehensive. Perhaps I could just ask you one point. What did you find the greatest barrier to you setting up your joint program? Because, you know, you've got a great program, it's, but it's not happened overnight. I appreciate. But what did you find as your biggest barrier? Uh, the, the I would say the biggest one was to be able to identify adult neurologists and adult psychiatrists available to dedicate time for our patients with DEE. So this was, in my opinion, when we were able to resolve that, all the other issues were much, much easier. I'm talking about the other issues. I remember it took us five years in our twin adult hospital to be able to have a camping, a bed for the mother to stay with the child when he's doing his 24 hours EEG. Because usually in adult facilities, the, the family uh, or the older, uh, or even sometimes the younger brother or sister do not stay there. So there were too many things, but really it was identifying our interlocutor, the person with whom we are building this. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So now to move towards, um, you know, what happens if we don't do it right? <laughs> and really to look and see how we how we can find out what's happening. Um, it's great to introduce uh, Professor Daniela um, de Andrade, who's Professor of Neurology and Director of the um, Adult Genetic Epilepsy Programme in Toronto and President-elect for the Canadian League Against Epilepsy. She's also, have a, as I've already pointed out, co-chair of the Transition Task Force of the International League Against Epilepsy, and like Rima, been working for some years in this area, trying to, from the other end, so to speak, from the adult perspective, trying to smooth transition and make sure we get it right. So over to you, Danielle, thank you very much. Can I just remind everybody actually, just if you have questions to type them in the question and answer box, and we'll attempt to address those at the end. Thank you, Danielle. I'll be talking about the issues of patients that are lost in transition. So I'll first show you a snapshot of transition in North America, what we see here right now. And then from the ILAE task force on transition, the results of the uh, uh, evaluation of the landscape of transition around the world. And finally, what can you do if you don't have a transition program? So definition of transition was said before, but it's the planned movement of adolescents with chronic medical conditions from the family center pediatric system to the patient center adult system. So exactly what Rima said about the issue of uh, the difficulty finding a day bed for parents of patients with DEEs that needed continuous EEG in the adult uh, program uh, tells us how the adult system is not geared towards the family, but just towards the patient. And that is a challenge for our patients. Here's one of the examples of a patient that was lost in transition. She was referred to me when she was 31 years old. She had Brett syndrome and her mother was desperate. And she said, we don't know what else to do. When she was in the pediatric hospital, she had 13 specialists. After she left that hospital, she was seen by her general practitioner only. And even though this is a wonderful person, our patient, our daughter is too complex for the general practitioner. We need help. So that's one of the examples, but we have seen many others, unfortunately, over the years that just got lost in transition. And patients with complex epilepsy that ended up being seen by just a, a family doctor or a general practitioner. So recently, we did a pilot study to understand the situation of patients leaving the pediatric system. And we tried to get patients outside academic centers and patients with common forms of epilepsy. But I have to admit our sample was somehow biased towards the uh, patients with more severe epilepsies. Uh, and what we had were patients in uh, a good number of those with Dravet syndrome, uh, some of those without a clear cause of their, uh, of their epilepsy, but other causes as well. But you can tell it was a complex population. 43% of them were having daily or weekly seizures. 36% of them were having monthly to yearly seizures. And only 20% of them were seizure-free for at least one year. And these patients had several comorbidities. Some of those that we see in patients with not DEE, which would be uh, depression and anxiety, but then ADHD is also, and insomnia is something that you can see in those patients that are not the DEEs, but the other ones with intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder. What was very sad to see is how much they lost access to care in the adult system compared to the pediatric system. So they had nurse, dietitian, speech therapist, physiotherapist, and other ones in the pediatric system. And when they moved to the adult, they didn't have access to those specialists anymore. One of the most striking ones was the psychologist. And, uh, uh, but in general, they lost access to most of the other health care providers in their uh, circle of care. 
Unfortunately, out of this group, 27% of the adult patients were still being seen by their child neurologist or their general pediatrician. And one of the patients was actually only getting care through emergency department, despite the fact that she was on two anti-seizure medications suggesting that her epilepsy was not that well um, controlled. So there was also a question, an interview with families, and this is someone else's work, uh, families with Dravet syndrome. And unfortunately, in, in the US at least, 71% of the adults with Dravet were still being seen by their child neurologists. So even though you might think, well, child neurologists will know a lot about this condition, but especially for the DEs, um, it's not very clear what happens to these patients when they get older. So the child neurologist will know as much as an adult neurologist about the natural history of these diseases as they get older. And of course, adults will have other problems uh, which are natural to just aging. So here's the first question. In the uh, Where you work, do you know of any transition program? And this is a very broad question because we're asking in the city uh, um, that you work, so not necessarily in your workplace, but please let us know if you are aware of any transition program where you work. So the majority said no, and then 30% said yes, and a group of people did not know. Okay. So that's important to understand the situation as well. So we wanted also to understand the landscape of transition around the world. So our task force created uh, an evaluation, a questionnaire, and with the help of the ILAE, it was distributed through the chapter. So we translated this questionnaire into eight languages, and then it was um, distributed through the ILAE chapters, and the responses were analyzed descriptively and descriptively and qualitatively summaries. So I'll show you here just a little bit of uh, what we found. So we had 306 people responding from 55 countries, a few more females than males, and a few more adult neurologists than child neurologists. Uh, and when we asked them if there was a transition in their program or their country, uh, here are the answers. So we saw that Europe and Central Asia, as well as North America, were the places where they were, or the respondents were aware of a transition program, either in their workplace or in their country. Um, that was not so common in other places, and in some, the respondents didn't know about uh, um, the transition in their country or their workplace. So some of the factors impacting the transition uh, has been uh, said to be the availability of adult neurologists of knowledge of the condition, so knowledge of the pediatric onset epilepsy. And this is something that we had seen before and we believe that one of the reasons, it might not be everything, but one of the reasons is that in the past, the adult neurologists were trained with uh, before the era of um, next generation sequencing. So what happened is you had a pediatric patient that was uh, evaluated with initially imaging and EEG studies and had a diagnosis. If it was a bit of a more complex case, this patient usually would have the karyotype, the metabolic tests, the biopsies, and many times they didn't have a diagnosis. So those patients came to the adult neurologist with the label of a symptomatic epilepsy. But now these patients are actually getting proper uh, genetic testing in many places, and then they come to the adult neurologist with their genetic conditions. So you have patients with PCDH19 clustering epilepsy, as the case that uh, Rima just mentioned, 
um, in her talk, we have patients with CT, CDH2, STXBP1, and, and the Dravis and all the other ones. So the adult neurologist really was not trained to see patients with this kind of conditions. And once you start separating them by their genetic disorder, you can understand that they do evolve differently. They're not the same group of patients with symptomatic epilepsy. So the PCDH19 tend to have more psychosis or even schizophrenia. The ones with uh, Dravi tend to have more of Parkinsonian symptoms, et cetera. And so each patient with their uh, within their own DEE will evolve in a different way. And the adult neurologist, unfortunately, was not um, trained to recognize and treat those comorbidities. Uh, in addition to that, the other factors impacting transition were that uh, the healthcare providers were concerned that patients and families would not have the same level of support in the adult system, which we saw in our um, pilot study, and that the patients could be too complex for the adult system. In terms of uh, when you look at regional analysis, uh, we had a similar issue. So the availability of a knowledgeable adult neurologist was one of the greatest concern and that the patient would not have uh, the support system across all regions. Interestingly, the type of insurance or the need of surgery uh, or neuromodulation were not significant factors um, impacting transition. And then the ketogenic diet was a barrier in North America, Middle East, North Africa, but less of a concern in Europe, uh, Caribbean, Latin America, and Central Asia. So that's something we have to explore a bit more to understand if those places where the ketogenic diet was not a barrier to transition, is it because the patients, uh, there were ketogenic diets in the adult programs, or is it because um, ketogenic diet is not a common treatment in the pediatric system, so it's not a big deal uh, in terms of transitioning to the adult system? It's something that we still need to understand a bit more. In terms of the healthcare professionals, uh, they almost 70% felt that they were less comfortable following complex patients with several comorbidities and failed treatments. 67% uh, felt that they were less comfortable treating patients with childhood epilepsy or epilepsy syndromes in general. Difficulty managing psychiatric and physical comorbidities in adults with epilepsy was uh, commented on by 62% of the patients. And something uh, that is important but not always said about is the additional workload. So compared to an adult patient with uh frontal lobe epilepsy or JME, a patient that comes with Rasmussen's or with a DEE is, can be much more complex and require a, a much uh, larger workload. And finally, the inadequate provider reimbursement for these complex patients. We also ask what are the gaps in patient education? And this is what the uh, healthcare professionals, so the neurologists thought about uh, that there was not much education in terms of vocational guidance, schooling options, sexuality and pregnancy, driving uh, requirements, and contraception needs. Uh, in terms of uh, when we asked the, the, the neurologists what should be their commitment towards the social supporter of patients? Um, the answers were slightly different in different um, regions, but certainly they thought that all of these were important, helping caregivers obtain extra funding, helping caregivers obtain power of attorney, helping with vocational orientation, facilitating help from community services and disclosing diagnosis to school employee and friends. Uh, so, again, additional barriers to building and sustaining would be 
communication difficulties between the pediatric neurology team during the transition, between the pediatric and the adult neurology team during the transition period, poor financial coverage, uh, pending evaluations during pediatric care that carry over to the adult healthcare system. So for instance, um, if a genetic investigation was initiated but not completed, or if uh, a surgical evaluation was initiated but not completed, so those were also considered barriers. Uh, instability and lack of hours allocated for the healthcare professionals to focus on transition of care. Anticipation from patients that adult healthcare system will have the answers to all their questions, which in the pediatric system, even if they don't have answers to all of their questions, they probably have more answers than what they get in the adult system usually. And the lack of connections between the pediatric and adult healthcare system. So what can you do if you don't have a transition program? So this is another poll we would like you to answer. Would you copy the chart and send everything to the new neurologist? Would you fill out an epilepsy history form and update the seizure emergency protocol? Would you email the adult neurologist that will receive the patient in the adult system and ask what do they want? Or would you ask the general practitioner to organize the transfer? And the, just to clarify, the epilepsy history form would be something to what um, Dr. Nabu mentioned regarding the epilepsy passport. And I'll talk a little more about that in the next few slides. So here's the answer. I'm happy to see that the majority chose to fill out the epilepsy history form and update the seizure emergency protocol. To be honest, um, when you don't have a transition program, things can be difficult. And in my opinion, these are the most important things. Uh, emailing the adult neurologist asking what they want to see, it could be a good strategy, but sometimes the adult neurologist would not know what they don't know, what they need to know. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one. Sorry by my technical difficulty here. Okay, there we go. So what do you do if you don't have a transition program? I would say try to do the best possible transfer of care. It's not the same, but I would say it's better than what is done in most places. Try to fill out the epilepsy history form or the passport uh, form. Uh, it has different names. I will use here the epilepsy history form, but similarly, it's a three-page document that should summarize the patient's history and update the seizure emergency protocol. So the epilepsy history form, this is uh, something published uh, in 2017. It's again, a three-page uh, document. And what you have are questions like, what is the cause? What is the epilepsy syndrome? Age of onset, medications tried, medications failed, uh, surgeries that were done, The um, if the patient has uh, what kind of comorbidities, how were they um, determined, and then results of uh, CT, MRIs, EGs, and all those things. So this is supposed to be in a three-page uh, summary. And then we have the emergency seizure protocol, and it should be very clear what the patient and the family should do at home, what drugs to use, when, in, is it with clusters, is it with prolonged seizures, both, what interval the drug should be used, when to call the ambulance, and then once the patient is in the ambulance or in hospital, what drugs, how to escalate, when to consider transferring to the ICU. So these are the kind of things that are important for any patient with epilepsy. I would say for patients with DEEs might be even more important because DEEs are really something that adult neurologists are not comfortable with. And adult emergency physicians in the emergency room are definitely not comfort comfortable with that. So having a seizure protocol that the family brings 
to the physician in the emergency room and tells them, this is what my doctor said that needs to be done is invaluable. Please don't send all the uh, records without the other things. You can send everything, but please also send the epilepsy history form and the emergency seizure protocol. Just think that this is uh, an adult neurologist who has never seen a patient and now has to go through sometimes 16, 17, 18 years of medical records. And they have usually one hour to see the patient. So I can guarantee most adult neurologists will not go through the charts as we would like them to do. And as I mentioned before, one of the barriers seen in transition was lack of financial compensation for the time spent. So even though we don't like to talk about this and we like to practice medicine as we are doing the best we can for our patients, the reality is that uh, most of us are constrained by um, the way the system works and, and how uh, a, a neurologist can be compensated. So the top three things would be do the best possible transfer, fill out an epilepsy history form and update the seizure emergency protocol. The nice to do things if you don't have a transition program, but you would still like, and maybe you have someone to help, would be to organize the referrals to the other specialists. So make sure that the patient will have an adult neurologist, but also an adult psychiatrist that is familiar with the EEs or familiar with um, epilepsies in general, uh, that they will have orthopedic surgeon and, and all the things that they need. Um, if possible, again, the transition readiness questionnaire, which is a simple questionnaire directed to the adolescent that is transitioning and another similar form but adapted to the parents or the caregivers. So one of them, so basically what you wanna know with this readiness questionnaire is if the patient knows uh, how to tell their epilepsy history in two, three lines. Uh, so if they have to be taken to the emergency room, they can tell someone I have epilepsy because I have this kind of lesion in my brain or this genetic problem. Uh, and I, uh, my medications are so, so, and so. The other things that the epilepsy, uh, the transition readiness questionnaire wants to answer is uh, if they know how to um, request refills of the medication, how to call the doctor to tell they're having side effects and things like this. And finally, the psychosocial screening to screen for things like um, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, home safety, and things like that. But this would be the ideal. So here's an example of the transition readiness questionnaire. And uh, in some cases, if you can empower the patient with uh, uh, some more directed um, documentation, one of the things we did for patients with Dravet syndrome was to create a cheat sheet. So the idea is to have a two-page document that the patients could download and carry with them and if necessary, they would show to the emergency physician or to the um, the new GP or whoever they needed to see that never heard about Dravet syndrome. So this is a simple two-page document that contains the clinical manifestations, issues about treatment, sodium channel blockers, when to use, when not to use, the, the um, uh, issues about vaccines, because these are patients that can have as a child vaccine triggered um, uh, or fever triggered uh, seizures. Um, so, and, and, and how they should actually be vaccinated as they grow older. So all those things, but very summarized to give some information to patients um, on, a, on, a, on a two page. So just to conclude now, the multidisciplinary clinic with joint visits like Dr. Nabu has is the ideal, uh, the dream of like, all of us have the dream of having a perfect uh, transition clinic like she has, but if not possible, it shouldn't prevent a smooth and complete transfer of care. Uh, the epilepsy history form is a tool that should be used uh, even when you don't, or mainly when you don't have a transition program so you can help sending this patient to the adult system uh, with 
uh, slightly better documentation, make sure the seizure emergency protocols are updated and empower patients and families uh, and share with them concerns and responsibilities. One of the things that uh, we had here in Toronto before we, we, we had our formal transition clinic was um, Epilepsy Toronto, which is actually a patient-led organization, would help us a lot in the transfer. So they would help us um, with uh, young uh, youth groups uh, to help accommodate the new patients that were coming. We'd talk to uh, um, adolescents that had gone through the process before and they could help each other. So these are things that are important to to. Um, if you have access to to offer patients. Uh, and that's the last thing I mentioned here. So I want to thank uh, everybody in this uh, transition task force, the members of our former transition task force, Dr. Nathalie Jeté, who helped us a lot with the uh, designing of the questionnaire, and people from our group who are helping us with data, uh, the questionnaires distribution and data interpretation. And finally, Drs. Carol and Peter Campfield, who have given us a lot of uh, guidance in, in transitioning these complex patients. So I will stop here. Thank you, Danielle, for that oversight. and. Uh you know, and useful tips about how we can move forward, even if we haven't got a transition um, service bespoke as um, perhaps Rima has. Um, oh, we have some questions in coming in, but while I read those, perhaps I can ask, because something that's that's come up on from both Rima and yourself is, you know, on the one hand, yes, the, the straightforward isn't the right word, but the more straightforward epilepsy is, you know, we have to think about that in a holistic way, moving forward into adulthood and giving them information. But there is the complex end and the challenge of finding specialists to, to take on their care. How can we move forward with that, do you think? What do we need to do to gain the interest? Because it's not traditional neurology care, is it? Because, you know, epilepsy... 10 years ago in an adult clinic was very much drug resistant, focal epilepsy, cognitively able, you know, and that forms the majority. So it's how they have the bandwidth to take on this new group of patients that actually for which we can do so much more than we could do 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I would say one of the things would be educating the adult neurologist on this um, on the DEs and a little bit more on genetic epilepsies. Um, there are patients that come to the adult neurologist with a diagnosis of, for instance, vaccination encephalopathy, when you know very well that could be a genetic epilepsy that needs to be tested again. So maybe this patient had genetic tests when they were very young, uh, but it needs to be updated. Uh, the other thing is to develop a connection with colleagues in the adult system. So even if you don't have a formal transition program, maybe you can identify that psychiatrist that is uh, that could start seeing your patients and you can have a good relationship in that you can always be in contact with each other and help each other how to better manage those adults with certain uh, psychiatric conditions that are not the same as the cognitively able uh, patient with epilepsy. So this one-to-one -one relationship uh, might be uh, cultivated so we can provide better care to our patients in general. Absolutely. Okay, so I can take some questions from the floor. And the first one, I'll probably talk it at you um, first, Danielle, because it actually comes from Canada. Um, but in places that don't have a transition clinic in place, how is it best, how can we advocate for funds for creating and implementing a clinic? And I can see that actually, if we look at a, a clinic or a service as rich as what Rima has described, it's not without need for resource. Um, and I would suspect it's a sort of, you begin small and you build on that. But I don't know whether either of you have comments on that. So one of the things that we are doing, so yes, yeah, start with what you have and start talking to your hospital uh, and, and, and your community and see what else is available and how some resources can be 
brought into uh, into the scene. But one of the things that we are doing here is the kind of realization that epilepsy is not the only condition that starts in childhood and, and goes on to adulthood. So um, we have recently connected with endocrinology, uh, GI, and other specialties, and we are working on getting something organized to show our um, stakeholders that this is a significant uh, area that, of population that is underserved in terms of having care in the adult system. Another thing that I thought was very interesting is about uh, the cost of this patients to the adult system. And there's some research actually coming from University of Toronto about patients with 22Q11.2 microdeletion syndrome, which many of them do have epilepsy. And very young patients cost the system, like patients in their 30s cost the system the same as patients in their late 70s. So if we keep giving this fragmented care, um, we cannot optimize their the, the the cost for their care. So once we get this united, we will probably be able to optimize the 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 costs as well. Maybe I can I can add very quickly that we initiated our program in 2013. Uh, we were able to have a nurse almost six years after that helped in the coordination. And what was very interesting and thinking about this relation with the adults, building this program and initiating it from the pediatric side, the adults were even more active and reactive because they were able to have more resources to answer this need. So, so it is also, I mean, pedi pediatric people, they do not have to, to feel alone into this because it is a really a common resources that we might share. And the other point that I wanted to emphasize on is about education of the young generations. I mean, when I talk about a, an epileptologist who is already uh, 60 or who is uh, 55 years old, it was not his basic activity, as Helen, you were saying about, it was more the complex focal, the epilepsy surgery, the IgEs in, in there, the pregnancy, all of these issues. So young generations that are must more, uh, I, they know more about these DEEs, hopefully, and they are more interested, can be really our ambassadors for these programs from both sides. Yeah. Thank you. So another key topic, um, I think, um, we've been asked is, in our experience, what percentage of transitioned adolescents have screened positive? For depression and anxiety and what factors were predictive of poor adherence and I think this um, raises the issue that we probably should be screening for it much more than perhaps we do um, and certainly some adult clinics I know screen from it routinely others don't but maybe we should be starting in adolescence um, I would find it very difficult to give a percentage but then again the mix of patients I have some of them it would be very difficult to determine but certainly in those who are diagnosed in adolescence, those who've had epilepsy longstanding and are more cognitively able, and even those who are have got mild learning disability, they really are at risk of depression um, and anxiety. I don't know what either of you have experience of that. So we, we don't have the numbers as well, uh, but one thing that uh, with our, within our, our uh, initial um, task force was uh, one of the recommendations was to continue the screening after the patients move to the adult system, not only in the pediatric system, which is very important, but also after they move. Because even if they screen negative <clears throat> in the, uh, after, it might be they might screen positive. And it's definitely something that needs to be incorporated into our day to day. Um, Rima, do you have anything to say on that or no? Okay. So, Just to another... say that I agree. 
Yeah. <laughs> Another key point and something my one of the adult neurologists that I work with is constantly saying is sometimes the patients are very bound to their pediatric epileptologist um, and would like to continue with them. Do you think it's possible to organize? Now, I know, you know, different systems work in different countries. And I know there are some countries of the world where that demarcation between adults and pediatrics probably isn't there. An adult, you know, neurologist or neurologists, I'm supposed not to call them adult neurologists anymore because they are adults, but neurologists, um, uh, you know, actually look after children and there isn't there isn't that transition with regard to neurological care because they continue and I know in other countries pediatric neurologists may be able to continue but that's certainly something we in, we are not able to do both from a service or a numbers point of view um, and there's no doubt I think part of it is that transition process is to prepare the families as to what's going to happen in the fact in your healthcare system um, because I mean, I, I, it seems like a bereavement process in some very complex cases. You've looked after them from naught to eighteen, and they are very, you know, it's very nice. But <laughs> um, and even the most complex one that I don't feel like I've done a lot for feel a little bound from an, you know, we've we've created a relationship, so it's very difficult, and that relationship won't be the same. You know, we have a very different approach in pediatrics to what perhaps adult services have in the sense they're much more used to dealing with the individual, not necessarily the carer, and may not be, I'm just thinking from my own, our own services, may not be as readily available. I mean, certainly we would hope that nurses were as readily available, but may not be as readily available because of the sheer volume of patients. So I think we have to think about it longer term and as part of that transition service, prepare our families and carers for what is likely to happen rather than being very attached to us. Do you have a comment on that? <laughs> I, I would say again, I mean, and I'm a Mediterranean person, so about all these sentimental issues, definitely we have an approach. I mean, we if uh, there is my board out, out there, and I know your board, Helen, we have every time there is a newborn in the family, we have these cards for Christmas and so on. <laughs> but I really believe... Not so much anymore. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you have your emails. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, what, what I mean, that there is a major point, in my opinion, when we want to be pragmatic, if we are able to secure for these families and for the patients the holistic care, definitely the feelings and the attachment might remain, but it will not remain seeking to come back for the care. So this is the only difference in my opinion. And in, in, in the work we are working on now on the last three years, 70 patients that we transferred to adults, proposing to them if there is a need to come back after the adult clinic, after two adult clinics indeed. We give our colleagues two chances. We had one person who asked to come back. It might not be the utmost criteria, but it means that when it was well prepared, they had answers they had the care and attachment. It is here, but it's for the care. It's OK to leave us and to go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Danielle, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I would say I agree with everything that is being said. Um, I would think of some other things that might and it again might be just a matter of education, but how many times a child neurologist will think about that particular medication affecting the patient's cholesterol level or osteoporosis risk or even pregnancy, teratogenicity and things like that. So I think the adult neurologist might, that is part of their training already. So it might help in the, in the like patients that are, getting older, becoming um, old adults. And um, so there's there's both sides. There's both sides to everything. I think it was very interesting. Um, 
we I think it was in an Epicare meeting, Rima, that uh, we had the patient perspective because the adult perspective was very much we should be preparing our patients better because their expectations are too high. And, um, and you know, we feel like to pride ourselves, we do prepare them quite, quite well, but she says obviously not totally. And the patient perspective or the parent perspective was one that they had already prepared themselves for different expectations within an adult clinic. And therefore, they have different questions to what they may pose to a paediatric neurologist. Um, and there is a degree of acceptance and how are we going to ma you know, manage this in the longer term rather than completely striving for cure and indeed seizure of control, which they've done all the way through their paediatric life. So there's a sort of shift even in the balance of what the, the families may expect with our more complex patients. OK, I think we've got time for another question. Um, somebody, and maybe it is a nice one to sort of come to the close on, really, um, asking about that maybe we briefly mentioned that we were working on a transition programme that could be used globally in the ILAE and how long until this is a reality. And I know this is something you've been working towards. So it's perhaps a little more information about what's going to happen moving forward from you both. I will go very quickly into this point and what Danielle and she will go more into this. We wanted to have the patients and the family's point of view in addition to the physician's point of view. Our goal was to emphasize, uh, I call it the core set data. What are the minimal things that really we don't have to miss? doing this transition and that a pediatric neurologist, wherever he is, even working alone, should be able to do in order to transfer the patients in the best conditions. And a part of these minimal things is what Danielle showed a bit in her talk, but we would like to have a wider international vision on that and this is what the task force, and it will be one of the session of our coming uh, symposium on transition. Danielle, if you want to add something. Well, no, I think that's it. So we have to acknowledge that different places have different resources. So we have to be able to um, give some guidance to everyone everywhere. So you might be able to do a wonderful uh, program like Rima has, but it, it's not a reality in most places. So what can we do to make sure the minimal core is met? How can we empower patients and empower families so they can also help themselves uh, if the system is not there to help them? Okay, thank you. So at the present time, we don't have any more questions in the chat. I think we'll give, um, well, if I ask Annabelle for the slides to come back up, please. Great. So it just takes me um, to thank our speakers, Rima and Danielle, for their time this afternoon, but also thank you um, out online for participating. You will be asked to complete a short survey that will pop up when you leave the forum. And we'd be really grateful if you could complete that so that we know uh, what we may do better. On Monday, you will receive an email with the details on how to access the virtual case to consolidate what you may have learned from today. If you keep an eye on the social media pages on our website for the ILAE, There'll be information about other educational events and activities that we're offering, particularly over 2024 and our future e-forum series. We've got another e-fora coming up over the next 12 months. And this e-forum will be available, recorded, of course, um, on demand from early next week. Next. Um, the e-fora that coming up over the next 12 months um, include talking about beyond seizures in, from both a paediatric point of view and an adult point of view and how we may recognise that and manage that in more complex um, DEs, as well as the role of um, early surgery and the, um, how we move forward in uh, emergency treatment management to prolong seizures in adulthood. So if you, when you, um, please remember to complete the survey 
and thank you very much for attending. Thank you all.